welcome. My name is James Packman and I'm the Rector, the Senior Minister here at Holy Trinity Church in Nailsy and I'm delighted to welcome you to Sunday Catch Up. Sunday Catch Up is where we take the Bible reading and the talk from last Sunday but make it available on the internet to those who might be blessed and encouraged by it and I hope that you are. If you would like to be in contact with us, please do get in contact. The details are on our church website, uh, www.htnailsy.org.uk. Please let us know if you've got any questions or if there's any way in which we can help you at this time. Thank you for joining us. I'm glad you can. May God bless you today. This reading is Matthew chapter 9, verses 18 to 26, and it can be found on page 974 of the Bibles. While he was saying this, a synagogue leader came and knelt before him and said, My daughter has just died, but come and put your hand on her, and she will live. Jesus got up and went with him, and so did the disciples. Just then, a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, if only I touch his cloak, I will be healed. Jesus turned and saw her. Take heart, daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. When Jesus entered the synagogue leader's house and saw the noisy crowd and the people playing, playing pipes, he said, go away. This girl is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand, and she got up. News of this spread through all that region. Let's pray for Robin as he comes to speak to us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your living word. We thank you for Robin and his gifts. And Lord, we just ask that our minds and hearts be open to all that you have to say to us this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. There are a couple of elderly brothers, um, and one of them was particularly poorly. And the doctor had called, and whilst the doctor was there, and so the two of them together, and uh, Dave is sort of lying down in bed, he, he just briefly raises himself up on one elbow, coughs slightly, and then drops back. The doctor waits a few moments and then just runs a few checks. He says, I'm sorry, sorry Jack, but um, Davy has gone. At which point Davy opened one eye <laughs> and said, I've not gone yet. At which point his brother said, now Davy, it's all right. Don't argue. <laughs> Doctor knows best. <laughs> and we have here the opposite to that. The girl is not dead, but asleep. Two stories interwoven here about the 12 year old girl and a woman who'd had a real problem for 12 years. But as we heard that story being read and possibly very familiar to us, we could have had been thinking, well, you know, I'd settle for even just a small fraction of that. Or, 
on hearing a story like that. It can even just completely disengage us as we think, well, that is not my experience. Life as I have come to know it is not like that. But the scriptures take us a bit further in and a bit further on. Further in, in the sense that we have the version as, read, as written by Matthew, Mark, and Luke add a few more details, emphasizing how these two situations are interwoven. And we find from the other writers that not only is the father called Jairus, but also by the time when he first comes to Jesus, his daughter is not dead at that point. Very seriously ill, but not yet died. And the father is coming to Jesus, pleading about this dying daughter of his. And so Jesus sets off on the way. And whilst he's going off, accompanied by some of the disciples, a hand reaches out from the crowd and touches him. And Jesus pauses and stops and initiates a conversation. And you can possibly guess what thoughts are going through Jairus at this point. Frustration, irritation, resentment. If someone in your home suffers a sudden sort of life critical experience and you've dialed 999999999 or whatever it is these days, um, in fact, it's usually quicker to make the phone call than for an ambulance to appear. But if one actually appears within the response time it's meant to, you get the first sense of it, the blue lights are reflecting from the buildings around. And the ambulance arrives. And as you go out, your next door neighbor also comes out. And says, Ian, glad you've come. I've been having a problem trying to turn my mother-in-law over in bed. Could you give us a hand? And the paramedics say, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. We'll, we'll, we'll come and we'll, we'll, that, that's just the sort of thing we can do. Yeah. The resentment would build up. And that will have been the Jairus situation. A marvel that he'd managed to get Jesus to set off. But now to find him just stopping and having this sort of a conversation, he will have been really irritated. And then the message comes. Don't bother the teacher anymore. The girl has died the resentment would turn to anger. Initially, perhaps, to the woman for having delayed Jesus, possibly onto Jesus for having allowed himself to be delayed. But then Jesus says, I'm coming. He goes to the house and, as we know, restores that youngster to life. These two interwoven stories about restoration to life on the one hand, restoration to health on the other. And we see that sort of Jesus has all the time in the world, all the time in heaven, to work on both situations and to resolve them. Different circumstances prompted those two people to approach Jesus. One doing it openly, one trying to do it anonymously. One having that direct contact, one trying to have almost indirect contact. One there encouraged by his sort of friends and supporters. One just wanting to remain an individual. And we, every one of us, will be somewhere on that scale that runs from one extreme being on the basis of past experience just having absolutely no or very low expectation through to the opposite end of the scale 
where it's taking on the lines of um, Paul writing to the Ephesians, talking about sort of the, the God who is able to do more than all we ask or imagine, according to his great power. And we'll be somewhere on the scale. At this point, just briefly take pause, because a couple of weeks ago, when Ruth was speaking about Jesus restoring sort of life into the limbs of a paralyzed man, Jesus addressed that man and said, take heart, son. And here, Jesus is saying to this woman, take heart, daughter. Take heart and engage. As we engage, we might catch a little bit more of that immeasurably more. Jesus, in his compassion, reached out to individuals. The Sermon on the Mount did not conclude with Jesus saying, right, you lot, all those of you with backaches, sort it. Those of you who come along with your friends helping you, but uh, you've got problems with your eyesight and your hearing, you're sorted. And those who have been a bit worried about the lumps and the bumps, don't worry, you'll all be all right. There was none of this sort of group work. Jesus worked with the individuals. And even though it's recorded sometimes that, that many were brought to Jesus, it will have been that individual touch in each situation. But the restoration to life, three instances were recorded in the Gospels. Here, Jesus restoring to life the dead girl. Another occasion when he, um, rather interestingly, just sort of stopped a funeral procession in its tracks and just, just sort of said to the person who was actually in the coffin, you know, sort of get up. Um, and Lazarus. When John the Baptist had his issues and his problems, Jesus sent the disciples to him, saying, just tell John the sort of things which are going on about the blind receiving their sight and so on, the dead being raised. We don't know how many instances there were. There could have been more than the three, very possibly. But not all those who died received that treatment. It would have been the best example of all. Imagine Jesus restoring John the Baptist after what had happened to him. To see John the Baptist going around, whose head had been removed at one point, um, that really would have made people sit up and take notice. Jesus just had a few who extended that ministry to. And even those who were restored to life would die again. Jairus' daughter... Lazarus, the son of that widow from Nain, each of those would have another death. Harry and Edna, and this time, this is a real couple. Harry and Edna were members of our church in Grimsby. Both in the 60s, Harry had been church warden. Edna had sort of a long-term condition so that virtually so Harry was effectively a constant carer. And then Harry was not so well, and it was diagnosed that he had a sort of mass on one, in one of his lungs. And the consultant had said, there can be an operation, but the operation itself is definitely life-threatening. Think about it. Well, this was back in the 1970s. So, Harry has to got to stop and think. Do I opt for the operation 
or not? He wasn't sure. So he said, can we pray that, because he was going to see the consultant on the Wednesday, he said, can you just ask the people in church to pray that at least I'll know which is the right decision to make, yes for the op or no to the op. So I explained the situation to folk, and after communion, Harry remained at the rail as people were praying, and I laid hands on him. So he went to the consultant, and the lung was completely healed. And a year later, Harry died from something entirely unrelated. But where he reached time, other care had been sorted out for Edna. There are such individual circumstances and different ways in which our God works. And Jesus having his teaching and his healing ministry, these were not just sort of, well, he happens to be able to do two things, this guy. They were just interwoven and interrelated. Because when he was healing the person who was paralyzed, he said to the folk around, in order that you might know that I have got the authority to forgive sins, I'm telling you, rise. One occasion when the person who was blind was having his height sight restored, Jesus then used that to speak about spiritual blindness. When he was on his way to restore life to Lazarus, he was talking about being the resurrection and the life. And elsewhere, talking about, I come to bring life. It is still right to pray for ourselves and for others who have the those things which we might call in need of healing. But, do we pray only about those things which are presenting themselves at that physical level? Or are we taking those hints from Jesus about forgiveness, about spiritual blindness, about life itself? Perhaps we should be praying for more. Because, let's be honest with ourselves, usually when we're praying either for ourselves or for someone else, we're praying that they may be taken back to where they were before. Before that cough started. Before that accident happened. Before this, that and the other the more we discover about our Lord, we discover that his mission is usually not to take us back to where we were, but to take us on from where we are. To move us forward, not to restore us back to where we were. And indeed, the, oh, some of those aspects are helpfully, beautifully, just sort of mixed up in, in the hymn, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven, where she sat high, ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven. You know, they're all sort of put together like that. Pick and mix. And the purpose of Jesus' mission and ministry, from his incarnation, through the passion, through the resurrection, onto the giving of the Spirit, all of this is for that ultimate restoration. We treasure those words about that promise that, you know, from, from God, how that ultimately there will be that time when there will be no more suffering, crying, mourning, pain anymore. Those are not words from Jesus just after the resurrection prior to the ascension saying, these things have now ended. We'd love it if he'd said it then. We'd love it if it came into operation then. But those words were spoken about the future. Then there will be no more mourning, crying, suffering, pain. The ultimate restoration. Earlier today in the 1045 service, we had the baptism of a youngster and tucked away in a part of the, the prayers for that. We're praying that Fleur would that something would happen 
to talk, talk about restoring the image of his glory. And that is something which we ought to be praying for and looking for in ourselves. That's the real restoration. The image of his glory. Making all things new. Again, that sort of bit from Ephesians. Praying that being rooted and established in love, you may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. To him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, etc., etc. Knowing, yes, his compassion, sensing something of his purpose, having that glorious mix at all levels that as we truly engage, we may receive what we would easily and readily call healing, physical, mental, emotional. It may be the beginning of seeing some things much more deeply. A real understanding of forgiveness. Something about the things of God. Or just to be taken on to grasp that love. Paul concluded that phrase by saying, sort of briefly, to God be the glory. But perhaps it's enough for us just to take the two words, take heart. So as we pray, let's take heart. Father, we have sensed only a part of your compassionate love to us. There are those things which we reach out for because it makes sense for us to reach out for them. But we believe that there are many other things that you would want to, us to be reaching out to you for. We pray that you would so work in our lives that we may be restored into that image of your glory and that meanwhile we might indeed take heart we ask it for Jesus' greater glory. Amen.